Following that, we will have the questions for 15 minutes. Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks, Ancona, for this nice introduction. I have to say it's a big pity I, I cannot I cannot be in India. Last time I visited Kerala, it was really wonderful and it was a, an amazing experience. So uh, it's it's a pity I cannot uh, come again and you know, meet with friends and, and students and colleagues. Um, so yeah, before I start, I would like to also thank the organizers for putting this amazing program together and for inviting me over. Uh, in Zoom. So today I'm going to talk about the um, photochemistry of retinal proteins. And um, the outline of my talk is the following. <clears throat> so in the introduction, I will talk about different photoreceptor proteins. And I'm, I will briefly mention rhodopsins. And then I have two aspects of the photochemistry. First, I will talk about spectral tuning and you know the models involved there. And then I will talk about the photoisomerization. Okay, so let's just start with a general uh, with a general introduction. So, what are photoreceptor proteins? Um, well, typically a photoreceptor protein is composed of an uh, apoprotein. It means uh, composed just of uh, regular amino acids, and then it has some cofactor, or we call it a chromophore because it interacts with light in the visible. And so, what happens with chromophore? makes this protein sensible to sensitive to light and when you shine light this chromophore absorbs uh, a light in the visible range and then it undergoes some change it can be a photoisomerization or proton transfer or some other rearrangement and then in the second step after the absorption and after the conversion it transduces the, the, the light energy through molecular energy to the protein. And, and as a consequence, the protein changes its shape. So this happens at the, this is from the biological level, but if you look at it from the technological perspective, these proteins are basically energy converters because they take a photon and then they, they, they produce um, molecular energy or even as you will see later, even electrical energy. So they, when, they con when they convert the energy, the output from the protein is, uh, is a signal. And so that's why it, these photoreceptor proteins have been utilized in many, uh, in various applications. So for example, if the photoreceptor protein happens to be also fluorescent, it can be nicely used in super resolution microscopy. You see on the left side, this is a regular microscopy, and on the right side, this is a, a, the same cell uh, visualized using super resolution microscopy. Here, photoreceptor proteins are used to be quickly switched on and off, um, mainly uh, fluorescence. And they, by, by, by switching on and off the fluorescence, they can uh, 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 allow to, to, to make a sharp contrast and increase the resolution. The other field where um, photoreceptor proteins have been used is optogenetics. Optogenetics combines the two, is a combination of opto, meaning light control, and genetics. And here, uh, the genes of a photoreceptor proteins are inserted in a living organism. And these genes use, usually encode a, a, a retinal protein, oh, but it can be also other proteins. And, th and then they, they make cells where they are in, in uh, where they are inserted, light sensitive. So here you see this famous experiment of a living mouse, which has uh, in the neural cells, uh, uh, a light sensitive retinal protein. And then there is this optical fiber cable, which guides the light through the skull inside, uh, inside the, the, the head, and then makes it uh, controllable by light. Okay, so what are the <clears throat> what are the common photoreceptor proteins? So here is an overview of uh, the major families in, in plants and in fungi, taken from the review from from Heinzen. So um, we have, for example, tryptophan, which is uh, present in the protein called UVR8. We have flavin, uh, which is found in the light oxygen voltage sensing protein called loftomain. We have another uh, uh, family of of proteins called cryptochromes, 
they also have a flavin chromophore. And then we have my favorite, my um, uh, family, which is rhodopsins, or also called retinal proteins, because all of them have the retinal chromophore. And then we have uh, uh, phytochromes, which are predominantly found in plants. The chromophore in, in this set of uh, uh, proteins is a linear tetrapyro. So there are four rings and they are uh, called pyros. They have also propionates and they are metabolized from chlorophyll or from hemes. Okay, so you also have an indication here in this graph on the top, the, the range of the absorption from different photoreceptor proteins. So all of them have the same, I mean, in each respective family, they have the same chromophore, but the, but the protein apparently is tuning. It allows to, to switch, uh, oh, sorry, it, it allows to cover a wide range of light. And while this figure was from 2011, 10 years ago, uh, rhodopsins were found to be covering a range from 475 to 570 nanometers. But in the recent year, they have, in the recent years, there have been new discoveries and the range of retinal proteins has been, ex has been extended to 690 nanometers. So, and, and, and I'm going to explain to you how, uh, how this tuning process takes place. But first I want to give a, a short introduction to rhodopsin. Uh, one of the most studied uh, uh, members of this family is the animal rhodopsin or the visual rhodopsin. It's found in our eye. So we have <clears throat> in the backside of our eye, we have a, so a layer called retina. And on this layer we have visual cells, they're called rod cells or cone cells. Here you see a representation of a rod cell. It has this elongated shape, it looks like an antenna. And then in the, in the outer uh, compartment of this, uh, of this rod cell, you have a, a large number of so-called disks. And then inside the membrane of each disk, you'll find the transmembrane protein, rhodopsin. This is the visual rhodopsin. And Inside the membrane, we have seven helices. And these seven helices, they form sort of a, a, a barrel type structure. And in the middle, uh, in the middle of this barrel, you have the chromophore, which is the, uh, in case of this visual rhodopsin, it's 11 cis retinal. It has six uh, conjugated double bonds. One, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, only the one, from the carbon 11, carbon 12 as the cis configuration. Okay, so, so, so all the rhodopsins have in common that they um, have this retinal chromophore. It's not always in cis, sometimes it's in trans, depending on the type of rhodopsin. They also have in common this seven transmembrane uh, protein structure, which sits inside the membrane. So now the first part that I want to address in this tutorial is um, how can we rationalize how can we rationalize the tuning of the absorption uh, maximum, which is called also spectral tuning, or in, in some researchers call it color tuning in retinal proteins. So um, I think this goes back to uh, the work of uh, Salem and Brookman in 1975. Um, who have investigated uh, the isomerization of retinol, and they noticed that inside, in the in the excited state, there was some uh, rearrangement of the charges in 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 retinol, and this was uh, then later uh, substantiated in 1973 years later by Arya Warshall, um, who said that actually there is a uh, a charge transfer, if you look here and on the top graph, the positive charge sits here on one end of the retinal, which is called the shift phase. And then upon excitation, this charge moves to the other end of the retinal, which is located at the better ion ring. So this uh, charge transfer inside retinal chromophore was established uh, in the end of the 70s. And then uh, Barry Honig, together with uh, the experimental group of Kichi Nakanishi, they came up with the external point charge model uh, for the spectral tuning in, 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 in rhodopsins. And I mean, interesting, 
it's an interesting uh, fact that actually Barry Honig, when he did this research, he was also at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, like, like my current uh, affiliation. So what, what is this point charge model actually predict and how does it work? So as I mentioned, in the ground state, this is the structure of the old trans retinol, the positive charge is located on the shift based nitrogen. And then upon excitation in S1, in the excited state, this positive charge moves to the beta ion ring. So there is this, this charge transfer. Now, if you look at the energies associated with this state, so the ground state energy is here, the excited state energy is here, and the difference between them is determining the absorption wavelengths. So now what happens uh, in the protein environment? In the protein environment, uh, you can have neutral amino acids, you can have polar amino acids, you can also have charged amino acids. So if you place an amino acid, which is charged next to the shift base, okay, what's going to happen is that here in the ground state where the positive charge is close, we are going to have a large stabilization, right? Because here is the positive and here is the counter and there's a negative charge. Now in the excited state, the charge moves further away. So the excited state will be stabilized less than the ground state. And therefore, if you look here in this scheme, the excited state is stabilized less and the ground state is stabilized more. So it means that the energy gap between the ground and excited state is going to increase. And now you can also imagine the opposite scenario, if you're going to put a negative charge here, close to the beta anion ring, then the excited state is going to be stabilized more than the ground state. Okay, so um, then we have we have opposite effects. So the energy gap is going to, instead of increasing, is going to decrease. So now basically biologists have this kind of. Uh, Thanks to this point charge model, they have a handle of how to control the absorption maximum in retinal proteins. So they can simply introduce a mutation in the protein, and this mutation can carry a charge or, or, or can be uh, without a charge, and this can influence the, uh, the absorption spectrum, max, the maximum of the absorption spectrum. Now, you can also ask, is there, is there actually uh, experimental evidence for this? Well, in a few years ago, um, the group of uh, Lars Andersen from Denmark and Joni Tocker, who is also in Israel, um, they have studied retinal isolated in gas phase. So it's retinal completely without, without the protein environment. And if you look here in this scheme, they studied this retinal analog. So here we have a, the large portion of the lysine side chain connected to the shift phase. Okay, this is called one plus. Then they replace it with two methyl groups. This is called two plus. And then they added different counter ions. Okay, so here's, uh, I think this D is called beta, beta in, and here's another theta ionic counter ion. And when you look at the experimental results, the, these are the spectra here. And then we also contributed with simulations. These are the sticks. You see clearly that if you go from the from the pure, from the isolated compound in blue, when you introduce the counter ion, uh, you move in the spectrum towards shorter wavelengths. So when you introduce, uh, when you introduce this beta in, which uh, has a smaller charge separation, you shift it by 0.2 electron volts um, to the blue. And if you introduce the, the bigger counter ion, then you shift it by, uh, 0.4. Okay, so now uh, what can we do today? Well, today we have a high level QMMM simulation. So we can we can not only produce these qualitative pictures where we have a point charge moving from one end to another, we can map out the entire protein, you know, we can map out the whole electrostatic potential from the protein and have an accurate map of how to change or how, how to tune the wavelengths. So here you see the old trans retinal. Now what we can do is we can, we can put 
uh, van der Waals sphere around each atom. And then we have this surface. And on this surface, we can now project the charges from the protein environment. So here you see uh, the, um, an example of the proteorhodopsin. You see here in the cartoon representation, the helices. And here you see key residues. There are two counterines. And then there is this one important uh, uh, residue, which is responsible for the color switch, color switch in proteorhodopsin, which I'm going to cover uh, in, the, in the second part of my talk. But what I wanted to show you is that now we can take all the charges from the protein and project it on this van der Waals sphere. And what we have now is we can see exactly how the protein in, uh, environment is interacting with the, uh, with the, with the retinal chromophore. So here you see a, a very strong red color. This indicates the negative interaction coming from the two counterines, which are negatively charged. And here on the other end, uh, on the top part of the beta non ring, you see uh, almost blue color. This indicates that there is some positive amino acid or, or neutral amino acid close by in the vicinity. Okay, so now we can we can use these maps from the uh, from the protein electrostatics and combine it with this point with the with the knowledge about the charge distribution in retinal and get a very accurate uh, prediction of the absorption maximum. And this is going to be uh, the subject of the of of my of my research talk. So I'm going to show you how we studied different mutants of proteorhodopsin and as I show you here in this preview, we will introduce a mutation to different residues and they will change the electrostatic potential on the retina. Okay, so now uh, this was the first part. This was the tutorial about the spectral tuning in retinal proteins. Now I'm going to talk about the second part, which is about the photoisomerization. So once a retinal absorbs a photon, it undergoes a conformational, conformational change. In, in the visual rhodopsin, where you start with 11 cis, you go to actually all trans. So this bond is going from cis to trans. And now, we, if you want to study it, like the most, the most accurate way to do it is to run a molecular dynamic simulation. So why, why do we choose a molecular dynamic simulation? Because it allows you to predict time-dependent properties, for example, we want to see the mechanism of this photoisomerization. It allows you, in classical dynamics, it allows you to equilibrate the structure of geometry. And it actually is the most realistic type of simulation. So what are the requirements to run an MD? Uh, so we have three quantities that we need. We need the coordinates. This is basically the structure of the protein or, uh, uh, or the retina. Then for each atom, we need velocities. And we need to calculate, we need to be able to calculate the forces. The forces are uh, the negative of the gradient. So if you have the energy, we can, by de deriving the energy, we can get the gradient. Now, how does it work? Well, we have a potential energy surface. This is a scheme. And we have our coordinates, which define this point here on the surface. And we have a time zero. This is the starting of our simulation. So we want to move forward from one time point to the next. And the way how we do it is that first, for a given set of coordinates at time zero, we calculate the potential energy. Okay, by, and in this case, we're using a quantum uh, chemical method. So we have a, uh, a wave function and we calculate the expectation value of this wave function. And then we get the potential energy and then uh, we make a derivative with respect to all coordinates. Um, I'm not sure what is wrong here. It's supposed to be a nabla operator, so it's derivative in x, y, and z. And the negative of the derivative is the force. And now, uh, according to Newton, Newton's law, from the force, we can extract, because the force is nothing else but the mass times the acceleration, we can extract the acceleration. And then the acceleration, we multiply it with the time step delta t, this is the time difference between two consecutive steps, and we get the change in the velocity. 
Okay, and then once and then once we 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 get the new velocities, we can propagate from time from from point zero to point one, and and get the next point and repeat the whole cycle again. So what I wanted to show on this slide is actually that molecular dynamics is not only associated with a, with a classical force field. It can use, in principle, any energy and, 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 and then the related gradients in order to propagate uh, a chemical system or, or a molecule in time. Now, there are different uh, time integration schemes. Uh, and one of the most popular uh, families, so-called the Verlet family of algorithms, so because of, I see that now I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go into detail, just gonna mention briefly. So there are three forms. This is the original form. Then there is the leapfrog form. And both of them have the problem that there is no velocity. So here you see coordinates are velocities and accelerations. In the original valet, there, is no, there are no velocities. In the leapfrog, the velocities are not available at the same time as the acceleration and the coordinates. They're only available for the half step. Now, in the, in the velocity extension of the Velay algorithm, the, the, um, the velocities, the coordinates and the acceleration are uh, obtained for the same time point. So that helps you to evaluate the potential energy and kinetic energy for the same time. And here I prepared a slide to show how it works. So it works in two steps. The velocity, velocity valet, you need the coordinates, you go to the next step. Uh, ah, you, you get the coordinates for the next step by using the coordinates, velocity is an acceleration. And then, in the, and then you also calculate the half step velocities. And then using in the second step, you, so between the first and the second, you evaluate the gradients one more time. And then in the second step, you actually take the half step velocities and the new acceleration to get the, the full step velocity. Okay, so what's the advantage of, uh, of having molecular dynamic simulation? So here's work by a Bill Hayes group. They have this um, study where they started from a transition state and um, in, in this example, there is this methane peroxide where, which interacts with the fluor, fluor anion. And they have used two different methods to, to, do the, to continue the simulation from the transition state. So the black line follows a molecular dynamics trajectory versus the red line, which follows the, um, the uh, uh, minimum energy pass optimization. So you see that actually following the optimization where you don't have kinetic energy, you end up having a D alcohol in complex with the fluoride. But if you run a molecular dynamics from the same to, uh, transition state, you will end up in a, in a dissociation, in a three body dissociation. So the molecule falls apart in three pieces. And for both simulations, they use exactly the same electronic structure method, just the type of the simulation was different. So it tells you that actually with molecular dynamics, you can get very different answers. Now, uh, this was a ground state simulation, but I, I, I mentioned that in retinal proteins, we are studying the photochemistry. So in photochemistry, actually it becomes much more complicated and that's why molecular dynamics is important. So instead of having a transition state, which connects A, the reactant to B, the product, Okay, and which is a stationary, stationary point and is characterized by transition vector, which leads to only one product. In photochemistry, we are facing so-called conical intersection. Now, a conical intersection in contrast to transition set is not a stationary point, it's a singularity because the derivative here is not determined. And instead of one transition vector, we have two vectors which form the so-called uh, branching plane. So they are shown here as X1 and X2. And they actually can also go back to the reactant of, or move forward to the product. So it allows to reach one or more products. Okay, I think I'm going to skip this slide. So how do we describe the, uh, this conical intersection? 
so the electronic structure method in order to the, the most uh, basic way to describe such a conical intersection is the use of the complete active space self-consistent field method how does this method work so first we have our chemical system let's say we have here an, a six orbitals okay one two three four five six this is the energy level and then the lowest three are w occupied so in the in the CASA cf method you describe uh, the wave function as a linear combination from uh, different configurations and each configuration is weighted by coefficients so how do we generate these configurations well we choose three igor you have five more minutes for you to okay finish. thanks thanks we are re we are choosing three different orbital spaces one is the inactive space and here is shown in green the orbitals are always w occupied in a second the gray uh, so-called active space we allow all possible configurations so we have two orbitals here and we have two electrons so we allow one electron okay we allow for example a transition from this electron to, to this orbital or we can promote both electrons to this orbital. so here in the active space we are generating all these configurations, okay? And so the active space is defined by the number of orbitals and the number of electrons. In this case, it's the active space is two electrons and two orbitals. Okay, um, so when we look at the retinal protein, uh, okay, this is the retinal protein. So how would you select an active space? Is there maybe someone in the audience who would or has an idea what would be the active space for the retinal? So the active space in this case, if you want to study um, the excitations in retinal, then we need to include the pi conjugated system. And I mentioned that it has six double bonds. And uh, so the six double bonds are formed from in total 12 P, orbit, P, P orbitals, they form six pi and six pi star. So in total, we have uh, six, 12 orbitals and 12 electrons. This will be the active space. Here, these are the bonding pi orbitals, one, two, three, four, five, six. And these are the anti-bonding, one, two, three, four, five, six. So in, all, in total, 12. So uh, this CASA CF method is actually quite expensive. Uh, because the number of the possible configuration is increasing very rapidly with the size of the active space. The more, the more electrons and the more orbitals you have, the larger is the number of the permutation that you can achieve inside the active space. However, it's really important to describe this uh, conical intersection correctly. Here's another example uh, why we need uh, in particular, CASA-CF, and why we need to do excited state molecular dynamics. So here is a study of ethylene, and this was done by the group of Todd Martinez. So he, they showed that actually transitions from the excited to the ground state take place at energy gaps, which are larger than zero. So it doesn't necessarily go through the conical section. Already in the vicinity, it can make a transition. And then on the right side, you also see that this transition occurs up several electron volts above the optimized minimum energy conical intersection. So it means that the dynamics using kinetic energy leads to different paths compared to optimization. Okay, uh, I think that's around about it. So I, I just listed a few uh, references for the CASI-CF method. And um, if I just have like one minute, I want to mention that a, a, a most common method to, 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 stu to study excited state is uh, uh, time-dependent density functional theory. And it works very well for excitation energy, and it's a very popular method. However, if you're talking about this photoisomerization and other photoprocesses, it has a, a severe uh, uh, shortcoming. It doesn't correctly describe conical intersection. So if you, as you see here in the comparison, uh, to a, okay, this is a slightly more advanced, improved CASA-CF version where perturbation is added. Instead of having a conical intersection, 
in case of this multi configurational method, TDDFT does not describe the two branching train vectors. It, it describes the degeneracy only in one degree of freedom. So it fails to describe uh, this, uh, the dimensionality of the conical intersection. And therefore, it's not recommended to use it to study photo processes which go through a conical intersection. Okay, I think with this I'm uh, I'm, I'm 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 finished. I finished the uh, the, the tutorial part, and uh, if there are any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Yes, <clears throat> thank you Igor, for a very nice uh, tutorial. And uh, if people have questions, either raise your hands or type them in the chat, and uh, we will uh, you know help unmute you, and so that you can ask your questions. Um, so while we wait for people to ask questions, Igor, maybe we can I can start off with a with a few questions that uh, I had. One is during oh, there's already one. So we'll just take it from the audience first. So can somebody help unmute Fabio Piccioli to ask the question? Yeah, I mean, I, you, I, can, I, I can read the question from. The, okay, from, I can read for you. Why is the positive charge localized rather than delocalized in the chromophore? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, it's not, uh, so the positive charge is not like, uh, I mean, okay, so it's not like, it's not, they're not too extreme, okay, localized and delocalized. It is, you're right, it is slightly delocalized, but the major, the major part of the charge is uh, on the more electronegative, on the more electronegative nitrogen, just simply because it's more electronegative than carbon. But you're right because of you can you can nicely draw resonance formulas and you can see that you can rearrange the conjugated double bonds and the positive charge will be also partially distributed on the on the polyene chain. Right. Okay. So this was one question, and I had one question related to the first part of your talk, Igor, where you were showing uh, the spectral tuning of retinal. Uh, mm -hmm. In the S zero and S one state, in yeah. the S zero state, you had uh, the the protonated amine, right? The the shifts amine kind of shift base, system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the yeah. shift base. But so, wouldn't this lose a proton? I mean, is is this proton also lost? That's from the S one state. Uh, it's not lost. So, yeah, that's a very good question. So, in the in the early days. Like in the once after retinal was discovered and the first spectroscopic study started, there was a dispute whether the primary event in 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 rhodopsin is is photoisomerization or or photo activated proton transfer or excited state proton transfer, and it turns out there is photoisomerization uh, because the process is just much faster than the proton than excited state proton transfer. However. In uh, there are like there is a the photo the photo isomerization is triggering like a, a cascade of processes in the ground state and then uh, in, among, uh, along this cascade in the so-called M intermediate the retinal indeed loses the proton so it happens later in the ground state but it's not it doesn't happen in the excited state. Okay. Okay. So there is uh, another question uh, by P yeah. Priyanka Pushparajan. Um, I'm not sure if she's able to unmute herself, but I can read the question for you. Yeah. Uh, Priyanka. I, I, okay. Yeah. If not TDDFT, which method best describes conical intersections? Does TDDFT fail only in the case of retina? Okay. Yeah. This is a good question. Um, I have to say that also in, 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 in my department here, we have also uh, Hardy Gross, who is the basically the, the theorist who developed this uh, formalism of TDDFT. And he always tells me TDDFT in principle is exact. So I have to, to make, I forgot to make another statement that actually the failure that I showed is for linear response TDDFT. So there, there, there are other uh, form ways of formulate TDDFT more accurate, which include du include double excitation. They can indeed treat conical intersections, but the most common one, like the ones that you have in the most common packages, like implemented like Gaussian or Orca, 
or TurboMol, they have linear response TDDFD, and that fails for all conical intersections. So if you want to describe conical dissection, uh, then I recommend to use uh, multi-reference methods such as CASA-CF or uh, cas 2 or there are other methods like nef 2 So they are multi-reference methods and they can treat these uh, conical dissections uh, correctly. And so TDDFT, or I should say linear response TDDFT, fails in all, in all cases, not only in retinal. Okay, there's another question by Fabio. How many AA residues, amino acid residues are included in the QM part? Yeah, okay, so this is also a, a, a very good technical question. So it depends, I mean, it depends on, uh, on the problem. So if you're talking now specifically about, if you're asking specifically about retinal proteins. So we are like in the, in the most recent study on, that we did on channel relapsing, we included uh, retinal and then, ah, the amino acids are two counterines uh, and, 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 and an asparagine and I think two water molecules. So in total, three amino acids have been included. But this is for um, for calculation of the excitation. And if you do dynamics, then we usually include only the retinal because the calculations are too expensive. Okay, great. I don't see any more questions in this. Okay. Hope that answered your question, Fabio. Uh, okay, now, may so, I ask uh, a question? Sure, please go ahead, Mahesh. Yeah, yeah, Igor, uh, I have a question. When you have this point charge model, let us say buried inside a protein pocket versus yeah. the point charge model when treated in polar solvents, uh, how do we go about selecting the uh, method? Would that be same or like, you know, would that be different? So the question is, uh, how do we select a method for uh, treating the this for for using it in protein or in the polar solvent? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So okay, so routinely I would say like uh, nowadays it's it's almost routine to use uh, um, to use a classical force field with static charges. For, for the protein and the same can be also uh, used for, for a solvent. Okay. And then the MM and the QM part interact through so-called electrostatic embedding. But if you, if you have like a highly polar solvent, which I mean, in principle, you also have highly polar residues. So there is a more recent development of using a polarizable force fields, or okay. if you can afford it, as Fabio said, you can include more residues in the surrounding. In the QM region, then you okay. you can use polarizable embedding or extend the QM region to to take an account for this. Yeah. I'll I'll take a look at that method. You were up. Thanks, Igor. Okay, great. Are there any more questions related to the first part of the talk? Yeah. Hello. Can I have one more? Question? Hi, Fabio. Hi. Yeah, sure you can. You can take one last yes. question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, very interesting, uh, Igor, uh, about your. Uh, Thanks. Um, explanations. Um, what about the preparation of the system? I mean, you start from a crystal structure, I think, and uh, then I guess uh, uh, you have to probably to adjust uh, and uh, check the hydrogens and then the, some exactly, maybe yeah. residues are not complete. And uh, so I think that's also quite a lot of work to prepare the system. Can you say something about it? Yes, precisely. Yeah, this is a, in, indeed a very challenging part because uh, most of the times the crystal structures are not complete, and, and this is due to maybe flexible flexible side chains. Like outside of the membrane, there are loops which move freely, and so sometimes we have to use homology model to complete missing residues. And then, even though if we have a complete structure, you're right that we need to uh, protonate because the crystal structure usually, and, and unless it's super resolution crystal structure below one axiom, usually it doesn't have uh, protons. So we need to 
protonate all the residues, and then we need to be specific. We need to be we need to take special care of titratable residues. So we need, for example, uh, uh, glutamic acids or aspartic acids. We need to know as a in the in the protonated form or the deprotonate because they carry a charge, and the same also for histidine. Um, so we need to, yeah, it takes some time to carefully prepare the structure. And then one goes through the classical uh, protocol of, you know, heating up the, the, the protein, and if necessary, embed it in the protein and then equilibrate it and check that the RMSD is not changing. And yeah, and then eventually, uh, right. So what we are doing now is we, once we have the full classical system, so using classical force field equilibrated, we usually go then from the classical simulation to QMM, and we do a sampling uh, using QMM in the ground state. And then from there, we start uh, the excited state calculation and also the dynamics. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Yes, so good answer question. to your question. Thanks. And uh, so, with that, Igor, we can move now on to your research talk, which is again going to be for 30 minutes. Okay. I'm going to switch the slides. Just give me a moment. Okay, almost there. Okay, here we go. So now I'm going to talk about um, like our recent studies on, on a specific type of retinal protein, which is called proteorhodopsin. So proteorhodopsin was discovered in the gamma proteobacteria in 2000 in the Monterey Bay in California. Now, uh, proteorhodopsin turns out is the most abundant microbial rhodopsin, uh, microbial rhodopsin. And because it's found in the ocean and the ocean covers most of the, uh, of the earth. Uh, the proteorhodopsin is uh, also responsible for 50% of the photosynthesis on the surface of the ocean. This was quite a surprising discovery because people have be believed that chlorophylls are making most of the photosynthesis. So what is the function of the proteorhodopsin? It acts as a light-driven proton path inside the cell. So basically it takes a protons from inside the cell and pumps them outside. Now, the interesting thing is that this proteobacteria which, found, which carry the protein are distributed in the ocean. So they are found in different depths. And in order to account for this depth in the, in the ocean, uh, proteorhodopsin has undergone some adaptation to the light condition. So here you see on the right side, uh, the light penetration through water. And you see that on the surface, the whole spectrum is available. But if you go deeper, then you see that the red part, the, the UV part is eliminated. And at 200 meters, only the blue, the blue part can effectively uh, penetrate. So proteorhodopsin has undergone some adaptation. And there are two variants or two subfamilies. There's one sub subfamily which absorbs blue light uh, at 490 nanometers, and the other one absorbs green light at 525 nanometers. So, and the major difference between them is uh, the mutation of the residue in position 105. So, in, in the blue proteorhodopsin, this residue is a glutamine, while in the green absorbing uh, proteorhodopsin, this residue is a leucine. So glutamine is polar and leucine is uh, neutral. So when you just take and mutate this amino acid uh, from leucine to glutamine, you can recover most of the shift. You can get go from 500 to 520, you get 20 of the 30 nanometer shift. Now, in order to study it, we have used uh, QMMM, but in addition, 
we have uh, used sampling. And I want to explain to you why we use sampling. So typically, if you study uh, a molecular system using quantum chemistry and the system is isolated, you can easily locate the minimum on the potential energy surface. You locate the minimum and then you do a vertical excitation. Uh, so you don't change the geometry and you calculate the excited state energy. And this is called the vertical excitation approximation. But in a protein, like the membrane protein, proteroidopsy, you have a very highly complex potential energy. There are many minima. And, and there is not one minima that is the lowest. There are several minima which are, which are quite low. So in order to make sure that we cover all of them, because different minimum might have different excitation energies, we are doing sampling. So basically we are making a QMM molecular dynamics, like I just said uh, to, uh, to Fabio. So we have this one nanosecond QMM using a semi-empirical method in order to be able to sample for a long time. Then we take 100 snapshots and we use both ADC2 and Cambis relief. And, and then we describe both uh, electrostatic embedding and polarizable embedding. This was the question from Mahesh. So we take a, a static charges and we take also an improved model where we have polarizable charges. And this was done in collaboration with Magnus, uh, who developed this polarizable embedding. So now here are the results. Uh, we have studied the wild type. Okay, so you see, first of all, you see relative changes. So uh, zero is the wild type. Okay, and then you see differences between the wild type and the protonated counterine D97 is here. Then you see the mutant of the Q105, which is the color switch residue here. And then you see double mutant or basically a Q100, uh, let's say variant. Q105 was limited to L and the counter end was protonated. And then we are here we mutated uh, a 97 counter end, D97 to uh, asparagine, and we mutated the uh, glutamine 105 to leucine. And this is a different type of, uh, this is the blue proteoidops. So these are the different types, and this is the relative change with respect to the wild type of, the, of this blue proteoidops. So you see experimentally, there is a strong uh, shift and this value is given in electron volts. So the, the, the absorption maximum is getting smaller in electron volts, so it means it's a red shift. And then if you, if you, if you mutate this counter to a neutral residue, it's, it, it has the same effect. If you mutate only glutamine, then the red shift is smaller. And then again, double mutants make it make it make the shift even bigger. And now you see the simulations. In red, you see TDDFT with electrostatic embedding and polarizable embedding. You see also ADC2, which is the algebraic diagrammatic construction to second order. So it's a it's some 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 wave function method combined with linear response theory. And here we use both electrostatic and polarizable embedding. And you see that although uh, some the match, we don't match exactly the spectral shift, the trend is reproduced with all the methods. So we have the same behavior that for the protonated counter ion and the mutated neutral residue, we have a large shift. For the Q105L, the, this color switch residue, we have a smaller shift, but it's, it's the correct shift in agreement with the experiment. And then we, again, we increase the shift. Okay, so what we have done now, we just established a simulation protocol and we said that indeed we can qualitatively get the same shifts. So we get the trends correctly with both methods. And now the next step is to understand and to check what happens, what is really the origin of this, what is really the origin of this shift. So what we have done, we have done something that cannot be done in experiment. We have repeated the simulation, but without the protein. So on the right side, you see the same spectral shifts, but without the protein. And the trend looks actually the same. It looks very similar. However, if you look carefully, there is a different scale. Now the spectral shifts are much, much smaller. Right here, we, we're going from zero to, 
almost half an electron volt. This is the range the scale. Here, the scale, if I put it on the same scale, like on the left, the shift is almost gone. So it means that the geometry alone, the geometry distortion alone is not responsible for the shift, right? Because there was, there was a, a study from, a, from a, a group in Frankfurt in Germany, and they have said that when, when they do an MR study, they measure it a significant stretch in the retinal carbon-14, carbon-15 bond. And they say that this stretch in the bond is responsible for the shift. But we showed by calculating the retinal in the gas phase that actually the shift without the protein is very, very small and it's actually negligible. So it's not the, the, the single bond which makes the shift. So, what we did instead, we checked. So what, what we did in addition, we, we carefully checked the bond, bond order alternation. So it's the difference between the average double bonds and the average single bonds. This is the value for the six variants that I showed you before. This is the wild type. This is the protonated counter ion, the mutated counter ion, the color switch mutation and so on. And we also looked just at this bond, okay? And we looked at its value, and indeed the value is really changing quite a lot. And then what we did, we correlated. We made a correlation between the snapshots, between the excitation energy and the geometry. So if you remember, each each absorption maximum that we got was based on hundred snapshots. So for each uh, of these hundred snapshots, we compared uh, the correlation between the absorption maximum and and the parameter. So you see here bond order alternation compared to the uh, absorption maximum or the bond length compared to absorption maximum. And indeed, we found a very good, very high correlation coefficient. So it was very high. It was high with the protein environment. And when we do, without the protein environment, it gets slightly lower. OK, so, oh. Oh, okay. Sorry, I think there is a mic. There, I'm missing one slide. Sorry, just a second. I think there is a mix up. I think I moved it by chance to the end. Ah, yeah, this is the slide. Sorry about it. Okay. So we showed that there is a high, high correlation, but if you remove the protein, um, then the shift becomes very small. So now what we do, what we have done is we, we, we did this map of the electrostatic potential of the protein. We mapped it on the whole, on the fundamental spheres of the retinal. And we did it for the Q105L mutant and for, for the Q105. And if you look at this map, I mean, it's very difficult to find a difference. They're almost the same. And the reason for this is because the counter ion, according to the point charge model that I presented in the tutorial, has the strongest effect. If you see, this is the scale for the electrostatic interaction. There's a highly red area here in both cases. So what we did next is we put all the charges to zero, except for this residue in position 105, because you see there is a that here it is some kind of greenish, here it is slightly bluish. So if you put all the charges to zero instead of 105, we'll see the pure effect of this position, of this residue in position 105. And indeed, the polar uh, glutamine in position 105 make, has a strong positive interaction with the positive electrostatic effect on the retina. Okay, so what we say, what we have found is that it's not the double bond, sorry, not the single bond that uh, uh, is affecting the spectrum, but it's more the electrostatic effect from this polar residue. So now the question is, and why, why is the shift? So why is it a red shift exactly in this position? So in here, I, I, in order to, to explain why it is the, this, why the shift occurs exactly for, for the interaction with the position 105 
in this location of retinal? Well, we have calculated the, the difference between the excited state and the ground state electron density. Okay, this is reporting the charge transfer. So we see here blue and, 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 and we see here uh, red. This is the electron density. So it's opposite to the, uh, to the positive charge that I showed you before. So it's a slightly different picture. So positive charge was sitting here on the shift base and moving to the better non ring. It means there is more electron density here now. So blue is a positive difference. So there is an additional density now here upon excitation and red is less electron density. So because this area here is rich in electrons in the excited state, and now there is, a, uh, there is this positive interaction coming from leucine, this explains the qualitative shift from the glucine, sorry, from the glutamine to leucine. Okay, so this was the first part uh, addressing the spectral tuning in proteoidopsin. But now I also mentioned that we studied the photoisomerization. So here I'm going to show you how we did the, how we studied the photoisomerization proteoidopsin. Um, so this was done not for the blue proteoidopsin, but we used the green proteoidopsin. So here we also used the sampling to get initial geometries and velocities. And here we use CASI-CF average for the ground state and the excited state with an active space of 12 electrons in 12 orbitals and a double zeta basis set. We used for the protein the ember force field. And then we launched 100 trajectories in the excited state. So this is what we found from 100 trajectories because we need to, to, to make sure that we are not running only one trajectory, we are running more because we want to get some statistics. So from the 100 trajectories, we found the following, that within the simulation time of one picosecond, 29 of them remained in the excited state, while the majority, 71, have relaxed to the ground state uh, through a conical intersection. And when they relax, 42, basically the majority has, have successfully isomerized to 13 cis, while 29, have returned back to the old runs. So now if you look, the uh, calculated yield of the successful isomerization is 59%. The experimental one uh, was 66%. So it's kind of, it's, it's in, the, in the same, let's say qualitatively, it's very similar. Okay, so then we decided to analyze what is the reason why some of them isomerized and some of them returned. And here I'm showing you the movie. So you see the protein environment represented by a force field. And here you see the, uh, the retinal chromophore. And this is the double bond, which is going to rotate. This is carbon 13, carbon 14. And here you will see that it rotates. Now on the bottom, you see the energy evolution. This is the simulation time from zero to 400 femtoseconds. This is the ground state. This is the excited state. And this green line is the moment where there is transition from the excited state to the ground state. So we have a, a transition through a conical intersection or in the vicinity of the conical intersection. Now I'm going to play the movie and you see here the evolution in the energy and you see also here the geometry. So when we come closer to the transition, you see now there is a st start, the hydrogen starts to, to move. And now we have a rotation. So after something like 400 femtoseconds, we have now formed the cis bond. Before we started from trans, now from the molecular dynamics, we formed, you see again, this is the, uh, the, the trans. And now you see that we formed in this particular trajectory, we form a successful product, uh, which is 13 cis. So the question is, uh, what, what makes retinal isomerize successfully and what makes it go back? But before I show you the, the, this mechanism and before I explain it, we have done another check. We looked at the, uh, 
change in the excited state population. Okay, so we this is our the blue one is the average excited state population, and we use we fitted it, we fitted this decay in the population, and it was found to be uh, calculated was two hundred thirty nine frames per second. Experimentally, it was three hundred frames per second. So. Uh, not only the yield, but also the excited state lifetime was found to be in good agreement with the experiment. So now what we have done, we have grouped all the 40 trajectories which were successfully isomerized and those 30 which did not isomerize. And then we, we looked at the evolution of the bonds. So you see the color-coded bonds purple double bond, green single bond, orange double bond, pink single bond, brown double bond. And you see indeed these double bonds are quite, sorry, these double bonds are quite short and the single bonds are long. But once we excite, then the bonds are inverted. And this is due to the charge transfer, the charge going from the shift phase to the beta ion ring. It, it makes the double bonds rearrange. So now the double bonds are becoming long, like single bonds, and the, and the single bonds are short, like double bonds. And this continues until we have the transition to the ground state. And then it, it again, the double bond becomes short and the single bond becomes long. And the same happened also, if you look at the behavior of the non-isomerized. So, so far we, we couldn't find the difference. Now in those trajectories which, which remained for the entire simulation in the excited state, we saw only one change. So the, 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 the bonds became, double bonds became longer, single bonds became shorter, but it didn't revert because there was no, no transition to the ground state. So then we looked further and we looked at the hydrogen out of plane mode. So the hydrogen out of plane mode is defined usually by two hydrogen atoms. Okay, and, and, and if they are in plane, then, then it's, the value is either 180 or zero. But if they move out of plane, then the value is significantly deviating from zero or 180. So now in this plot, these are the trajectories which I summarize, and this one which I did not I summarize. You see that the hydrogen angle from purple, blue and green, the hydros, and you see that the, the nitrogen 15 and 11, 12, they did not change, but the entire change comes from the 13, 14, which goes from, from trans to cis. In the other case, um, we saw that actually there is some large fluctuation, but there is no significant change. If you consider that the, the range here is like something like 20, 30 degrees, this is just regular fluctuation. And, uh, but of course, this is a non isomerized uh, subset of the trajectories. So that's why we don't expect to see large changes here. Now, when we have no hop, then the fluctuation becomes even smaller. The fluctuation around the dihedral angle is now in the range of five or 10 degrees. So we still didn't find, we still didn't find the reason for this uh, successful or unsuccessful as a relation. So then we decided to look at the, at the point charge, sorry, on the molecular charge. As I said in the tutorial, the positive charge in the ground state is localized on the shift phase. Upon excitation, there is a charge transfer and now the positive charge is located on the beta ion. So what we did, we divided, because this bond is the one which is isomerizing, we divided the retinal in two fragments the fragments starting from carbon 14 and the, and the other one, including all the atoms until carbon 13. And then we summed up all the charges for the beta ion part and for the shift phase part. And then we plotted them for the isomerized subset and for the non-isomerized. So here you see the plot of the one part charge and here's the other one. So what we see basically zero now is the time of the transition. And now we start to see a remarkable, I mean, some noticeable difference. So when we have this approach and there is a transition at time zero, then the charge, which was originally very like localized on this unit, 
okay, starts to starts to decrease and then it increases again. The same also if you look uh, on the other half, it starts to increase and then it decreases again. But for those which are known, I summarized, we notice that even after the transition, okay, the charge discharges. Uh, for, for the ground and excited state, they, 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 they are still somehow coupled. So after the transition at time zero, they're first the same, and then they, they, there is slight difference, but they, they are not like at the beginning of the tra trajectory clearly separated. They have the same sign. So here in this case, for the better known part, both are negative. For the shift based part, both are positive. So there is some charge, some change in the, in the charge distribution. And so what can cause this change in the charge distribution? And uh, as I showed in the tutorial, there can be a residue close by. So for example, a negative charge residue, which, which can stabilize the positive charge uh, in the area outside of the better unknown ring. So in the excited state, if you have a counter ion, which is close to carbon 13, then it will stabilize the positive charge in this carbon 13. And so what we have done then is uh, we have looked at the diff distance from this counter ion 97 to the atoms of carbon 13, 14, and 15, and the nitrogen. And we saw that actually the, in the case of the isomerized bond, sorry, in the case of the isomerized trajectories, the distance has dramatically changed. So it was just before the transition, the, uh, the distance from carbon 15 and the nitrogen was, was large and the nitrogen carbon 13 and 14 was close, but immediately after the, after the approach, sorry, after the transition, then carbon 14 and carbon start to move away while carbon 13 was still kind of close. Now, in case of the non isomerized, you see that carbon 14 did move, did not move far away, and instead carbon 13 was approaching this counter ion. So that's why it did not isomerize because, because this carbon 13 was the positive charge was stabilized on the by the aspartate by the counter ion 97. So to uh, cut the long story because short, you have around four minutes for your talk. Thanks. So to cut the, sh the long story short, we found that this counter ion has, has a profound impact on the outcome of the photoisomerization because in some trajectories it comes close to the retinal and then it stabilizes the positive charge. Now, this is a hypothesis uh, that we have obtained from the simulation. So now the question is, how can we prove it? So we have repeated the simulation in the gas phase. So now we have done it outside of the protein simulation. And what we found is now that the, the yield of the isomerization has gone significantly down. It's now, instead of 60, it's 30%, 37. And the excited state lifetime has almost doubled from, from, uh, from 250 to 560 femtoseconds. Now, interestingly, in the gas phase, 63% of the trajectories they go through the CI and they twist around the 11 12th of the bond, not 13 14. And we found even 37% where they twist around the 9 12 double bond. So, therefore, we found that actually the, the protein environment is not only responsible for the success, meaning if it goes from trans to cis or trans and then back to trans, but it also selects the bond for isomerization. So it's, it also tells you which bonds will I summarize. Okay. So here's the conclusion. Uh, I showed you that the spectral tuning in proteinodopsin is due to the polarization from the amino acid in position 105. And, uh, and I showed you in the second part of the isomerization that the counter end plays an important role in determining the outcome of the excited state dynamics. It does select the double bond for isomerization and it causes uh, the trajectories to isomerize successfully. 
So with this, I'm coming to the end of my talk, and I would just like to show the acknowledgement or to give acknowledgement. So all of this research would have not been possible without uh, excellent coworkers in my in my group. So um, the first part about the spectral tuning. This is research carried out by Gil Amoyan, who was a bachelor student in my lab, and uh, John Church, who is the postdoc, who did the, uh, this analysis of the charge distribution. And the second part about the um, photoisomerization in proterodopsin was carried out by, uh, by Samik, who, is a, who was also a postdoc and who is now uh, continuing uh, his research in the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. And last but not least, I would also like to acknowledge uh, uh, funding bodies, which have uh, allowed me to uh, get computer resources and also finance the, the group, and also collaborations in this project. So thank you also for your attention, and um, I will be happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks a lot, Igor. This was, this was really fascinating with the molecular insights that you have been able to gain. Uh, on this system. So the floor is now open for questions and you can either uh, use the reactions uh, uh, box to put your hands up or raise your hands up or write questions in the chat box. Okay, I have, we have already one question from Imon. Um, Imon, you can unmute yourself now and ask the question. Yeah, uh, nice talk you got. And uh, so my question is like uh, the counter anions like aspartate, uh, mostly aspartate, I think, those are also incorporated in the QM region or those are just uh, taken care of with the amber force field? Yeah, hi, hi, Mon. thanks. This is a great question. Um, so in, in this simulation, uh, the aspartate was outside of the QM region. Um, so it, 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 it has carries a negative charge and uh, yeah. So it's so just a charge it, effect, not any. Yeah, exactly. It, it, with, okay. it, the, the, the charge of this counter and is static. It does not change due to polarization. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, can I ask one more? Like, sure. yeah. so, yes, I don't see any other hands raised, so you can go ahead. Uh, so if you change it with a polarization model, do you think that the percentage of uh, cis trans isomerization will change or okay yeah this yeah. is an excellent question as well <laughs> thank you i mean i i am um i mean we have to do the simulation in order to to, to give it a definite answer but but uh, uh, at the current stage i i think it wouldn't change the, it wouldn't change the result and the reason is because uh because the distance i mean it's because the distance is, not, I mean, it's it's what I think two between two and three angstroms. So from such a long distance, I mean, what matters is is the, the fact that it carries a negative charge. So I think that the polarization effect on this range will be probably a minor, minor effect. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I don't see any more questions in the chat box, but in the meantime, since we have some time, I have to ask the question. And if somebody else has a question, please raise your hands. Uh, so, Igor, when you were doing the initial calculations for the shift in the mutants, when you removed the protein, did you uh, just look at the geometries? I mean, how would you then incorporate uh, mutations if you didn't have the protein at all? The, the initial graphs that you showed. Is Igor around or?
Did Igor lose his connection? Yes. Yes, he it looks like connection. yeah, it looks like there was a break in his connection. Okay, we will wait. Hopefully, he's going to try to reconnect back. And uh, if there are any other questions, people can start thinking in the meantime. Here he is. Okay, he's back. You got there was a break in your connection, I think. <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi. I think there was I a break in my, your my, connection. My left. My laptop crashed and I, I had a blue screen and I'm restarting it. So I okay. connected the phone. Sorry about it. Okay. Okay. But no I, problem. I think I, I heard your question before before I got out. So you were asking me how we did the gas phase simulation? Yes, when you removed the protein. So initially you did the simulations with the protein and then you removed the protein and showed that the changes were very low. I mean, less, the extent of changes were less, lesser. Yes. In terms so, of that option shift. So what we did, we, we, we kept the we kept the retinal geometry uh, like in the protein. We didn't change, we didn't touch the geometry. We took it from the same snapshots, but then we just put, we just mm -hmm. removed the protein. So in this for for us uh, in the simulation, it's very easy to do. You just uh, delete the atoms of the of the protein, or you put the charges to zero. So it was not such a big thing. And, but, but it helped us to understand the spectral tuning because what we found was that if you remove the protein, then the spectral shift is becoming much, much smaller. So it means that it's not just by the, by the retinal geometry. It must come from the protein. Exactly. But then the important thing about these two mutants is that the leucine is being muted to, to glutamine. And you're even removing that leucine and the glutamine, right? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Precisely. Ah, wait a moment. Mm -hmm. Wait a moment. You're talking about the um, you're talking about the calculation of the excitation energy, which changes the shift in the gas phase, or you you mean this visualization? Yes. The, the the initial graph that you showed, where you were calculating the shifts. Ah, okay. Yeah, so we removed everything. Yeah, we removed everything, all the residues. Okay. No, because, I mean, sorry, maybe I didn't explain it well. Um, there was this claim by the group in Frankfurt. They say that, um, the, that there is some stretch of the C14, C15 bond. So if, that, if this claim is true, then we can remove the protein and the bond stretch alone would make this diff would explain the difference. So when we did this comparison, then we saw that the, the shift also was removed. So that's why that's how we could uh, exclude this uh, bond stretch as a make as an explanation. Okay. Are there any more questions uh, from the audience? I don't see any more questions in the chat box, but. If there are no more questions, then let us please use the reactions box to appreciate the talk. And I can, of course, clap for Igor. Thank you. Thanks. Fascinating result.